Good day, Hollywood Times viewers. Judy Shields here. Today, we welcome actor, author, and soon-to-be podcaster, Teo Pengelis. Did I pronounce that right? Yes, that was very good. Yes, I mean, you know, <gasps> or Tonto. I don't know. It's, people just look at that name, I suppose, because we're not used to it, you know, with the double A's. And, uh, but, <laughs> you know, and the, the Greek name is much more simple. Uh, uh, but, you know, as far as my, when I came to America, I changed some of the spelling. Okay. Just a little bit more elaborate, but uh, we anglicized it in Australia when I where I was born because uh, Europeans were not that welcome at the time, and so we went from Penglis to Pengly, mm -hmm. and that was you know. So you know, we've all through lived through those times. We're still living through different times, but you know, society adjusts, and hopefully, we we'll get better at it. Exactly. What took your parents to um, Australia? I think because the island of Castellorizo in Greece had been attacked by the Germans, you know, during the Second World War, it was uh, horrific what happened. And I think there was about a quarter of a million Jews, Greek Jews, who were uh, also slaughtered. So uh, apart from having 350 years of, of being inhabited by the Turks. So, you know, Greece went through a lot. And um, I had written an article, The Whispered Past, because the Greeks had to whisper to each other in order to keep their their um, education and, and also their cultural yeah. uh, changes, uh, because the Turks wanted them to live under their rules. And so the Greeks, being who they were, would meet, you know, in the basements of churches and priests would teach. And so when they came to Australia, it was interesting because everything was done very quietly and whispered. And I thought there was something behind that as a character. And as an actor, I realized, why did they whisper so much? And they whispered because so they wouldn't have the Turks hear them for those 350 years. So it's funny how those things from other uh, societies, cultures imposed upon the culture they had in, were inhabiting at the time. They were not a great influence, the Turks, rather a cruel, the Ottomans. I'm not saying today, but the Ottomans at the time were terrible. Uh, that's why they call it history, right? There's so much for us to learn yeah. even today, right? Every day we can learn something new about history and, and our culture and you know where we came from is surprising, isn't it? Yes, where's your history? Uh, my father uh, is... Scottish and German. <laughs> My mother was Spanish and Spain, Spain and Mexico. So I'm like a half breed. <laughs> I'm a mutt. Oh, it's funny. I did my uh, DNA and I found that um, all the influences and the stories I was very interested in through the years really had to do with my background, not realizing what it was. So they, I, I came out 48% Italian Greek, and the rest was from Tunisia, from Alexandria, from Turkey. So all that whole area, there was a big influence. So I see why I have been drawn to these stories that I've been writing and exploring, um, because it had to do with my DNA. And, you know, intuition's an interesting thing. You don't always... No, because, you know, you sharpen your tools as you start life, and then you find out that you are much clearer about your identity. And then uh, when I found, uh, I went to Egypt 14 times now, I'm going back to Turkey uh, in the next few weeks, um, because that country also resonates, because my great-grandparents came from um, Constantinople at the time, from the 15th century we have been there. And so they migrated to a small island called Castellorizo. And um, I went once. It was fine. It's not as romantic as I remembered my parents telling me. But, uh, <laughs> you know, you find what resonates with you. And I found Egypt and I found uh, Italy and Greece, the three countries I'm most attracted to. Oh, yes. Beautiful places. Never been, but I've seen it on TV and specials. It's amazing. I love to see documentaries about Greece. It's just breathtaking there. Yeah. And the book I, I, I wrote uh, a, a few years ago is called Places, uh, like you just mentioned, because, um, you know, you don't know what you take in while you're in it. It's until you come back home through the door that you had first started that journey that you get to realize 
what it was all about and what you understood more about yourself than from the time you left. That's part of why I always think to to people, journey as much as you can. It's the best education you can have because once you understand other cultures, you get a better sense of self. Yeah, no kidding, you know, because that's what's important, you know, yes. to tell our, to teach our kids and our grandkids. It's, it's great to be able to have stories to tell them, you know, about their heritage yeah. too. So yeah, uh, yeah. I wanted I wanted to ask you, um, you know, growing up in Australia, um, that must have been pretty cool as a young boy. Uh, what adventures did you like exploring growing up? Well, when I was, I didn't have a, a, I can't say the life I had in Australia was a happy one. Um, everything we did was basically Greek because my mother never spoke English. Okay. Um, Australia was very Anglo-Saxon. And so we had to learn while we were going to Greek school, we were going to, in the day school, we went to English school. And there was a bit of a conflict because we had different cuisines. We spoke another language. All those things about our culture didn't resonate right away. They never do. Uh, you realize that it takes a, a, a good decade or two for, for those things to blend into the society and allowing it because, you know, let's face it, we've been doing it today. Look how much we, we there was all this battle about Europeans and, and Middle Eastern people coming into this country because it's foreign. It's, an, it's ignorant. It's not wanting to understand other cultures because it feels threatening to you. And, and then you say to yourself, but we're all, uh, we're all immigrants. I mean, I don't understand why people object no. to other countries, <laughs> especially if they're coming in legally. I'm not saying illegally. Yes. But um, I became an immigration official. That's why I was very much uh, into understanding other cultures. And so for three years, I used to meet all uh, the Southern European women, some British, uh, Italians, Yugoslavs, um, on the assisted passage. And so I got to understand how they lived. And because my parents came to Australia poor, um, I wanted to go beyond them. So I was looking for adventures then yeah. without realizing where it was going to take me. And so one day I decided I was going to go to America because all the movies I saw in those days, America was beautiful. America and its manners, its its schooling, its its movie stars, you know, all its history was fascinating. And I found that I wanted to know more about it. And therefore, I got a free trip to America when I met the head of the Ballet Folklorico of Mexico, Amalia Hernandez. And I went to Mexico City. I stayed there for a couple of months. And then from there, I went to New York. And then I worked for a year with the UN. And then from there, I someone took me to an acting class. And then it all started. And not that I fell in love with acting. I thought it was kind of stupid in the beginning because I was not very good at it. And so the teacher told me she couldn't tell the difference between me and the chair. And so um, that was not a great auspicious beginning, you know, standing on the stage <laughs> and being shy and um, not knowing, uh, you know, people couldn't understand because I had an accent, well, worse than the one I've got, you know. It was, it was you know, very nice day today. And they were saying, what's he saying? <laughs> so I had to get rid of all that. And that took time. But... Um, how do you get rid of all that? Speech you therapist? Know. Teacher? <laughs> I, I went to a coach, voice coach, too. And, um, he helped me with... I was not, uh, not good at doing the R's. That was not, you know, the way we sharpen the R's in this country. You wow. know, we were not... We speak in a flat term, Australians. And so to change that rhythm, um, unless, you know, a lot of actors from Australia study it before they come here, so therefore, it's a part of their curriculum. But for me, I was just a wanderer. I was escaping the Greek society, wanting to find out where the hell could I find a mentor who could tell me what I didn't know and teach me where to go. And I did. And it was a, a well-known director who became my teacher, and I was his assistant, Milton Katselis. And he was the assistant to Elia Kazan. And so... I got, when he asked me to become his assistant, I didn't like him very much. I thought he was a very arrogant man, as Greeks are. And and he said to me, I'd like you to be my assistant. And I said, no. And he said, no. No, I said, because I don't like you. So he was like, he couldn't understand my method. But eventually, I became his best assistant. 
And I was with him for 40 years. 40? Wow. Yeah. So I studied with him for well over 30 years. And 10 years, I was his assistant. And so, you know, I learned so much. And therefore, I realized I was really in search of, of knowledge, of things, because I had no idea who I was. I wasn't taught. I was just taught other people's opinions. And those were imposed on me. Just like when you go to school and they tell you which to study, and you're yeah. saying that doesn't interest me. But the the and the the subject that interests me was history. Oh yes. And it's interesting that years later it became part or big part of my own revolution in life to become. And so now that I have become in life, I realize I can look back at the arc that I created and think, along with all the mistakes and the struggles. They were all part of the learning process that, you know, you have to climb fences because you don't know what's the other, on the other side. Sometimes we find on the other side it's not particularly uh, <laughs> excitable. Uh, you want to dodge it. You want to escape it. And then you find out, no, you've got to face it. And so, Yeah, that's a great way to look at life. So for viewers, for those of you who may not know who KO is, you should, he's uh, been on Days of Our Lives for like four decades Um where you played like two lookalike villains, Count Tony Demira and impersonator Andre Demira. What, what, how did you, that role come about for you? Uh, it came out of the strike. Um, the in in the early eighties, we had a strike for nine months. I had just come off doing three films and a show in New York. I was doing quite well, um, and the last one was with Ken Russell, and that went very well. And it became a classic, Altered States. And I worked with Bill Hurt. And then when I was getting a lot of attention because I was a new face in Hollywood, suddenly the strike came, like we are living now, which yeah. is kind of ironic. Right. And uh, the only thing open at the time were soaps. And so I got into General Hospital. Uh, and from General Hospital, I, I was the only one who survived the 30 actors who were in the story of Luke and Laura about about the uh, the uh, uh, the princess story and and then the head writer who moved on to uh, Days of Our Lives took me with her and okay. uh, and that's how I got I had to test but I that's how I got into the field and I, I you know what was wonderful about it all yeah. someone said to me why do you want to be an actor and I said I want to make some money <laughs> well, actors don't make money. I said, well, I have to make some money because I've got too many journeys to take. And so I became a, the actor. And when I started to see the money I could make, they paid for my journeys. And so when you think that in 1981, I planted a seed that will create my history and I'm still living it. Wow. Oh, my goodness. And that's what that inspired you to uh, to write your memoir? you know, all that, that you've been able to do? Well, I yeah, I wrote the book Places. It's basically a memoir of all the journeys I've taken. Um, the second book was Seducing Celebrities One Meal at a Time. <laughs> um, yes, that was because I wrote <laughs> Yeah, well, you know, my a, a manager had called me one day and said, you know, I, I we've got an offer to for you to do a cookbook. And I said, so what do we call it? So they gave me some names. And I said, well, what is food, really? Food is to seduce people, to me. You know what I mean? You come in. How do you seduce them? They come in and you create an atmosphere, You, you the aroma, the atmosphere that you create, all those things, the lighting. They said that when people come, they feel like they're in a very special place. And then when they sit at the dining table, which I call my watering hole, <laughs> I want them to remain there as much as possible. You don't want them wandering all over your house. <laughs> so the way you keep them in that circle is bringing people in who resonate with each other and have good conversations. And also, you know, there are some that create obstacles because that's who they are and they want conflict. But, you know, you the main thing is is preparing the food and serving it. And it's been a hit for many, many years because I was introduced to that when I was in New York. You know, people in New York, I remember, and the people I knew from the UN all ate well. And then working with Milton, who was a food expert, didn't cook, but he was a food expert. Yeah. Um, he would always say to me, make some Greek lemon soup, make this, make that. And so I learned early on how to present things. And 
it's all part of the curriculum of, of what your character is and how it becomes. You know? I'll definitely have to add that to my uh, cookbooks. Sounds amazing. I'll have to look that up. <laughs> yes, it's it's got a lot of, I mean, a lot of the recipes came out of my head, but I also called my sisters because they're good at making desserts. Oh. So I've eaten a lot of Greek desserts that way. And, um, and also, you know, I'm the kind of cook that opens a fridge and sees what's there and makes something out of it rather than getting a cookbook and going to the store to copy it because, you know, not all recipes work. It depends on how yeah. fresh the food is, you know, the flavors change. Exactly. So what's your favorite dish to prepare? Well, when it's a large group, um, probably moussaka because it's all in one tray and you can serve it. Um, individually, I like to do scallops with... Um, with um what do you call it? scallops with um the little black um little green things the um the, um oh i know right capers. <laughs> I your tongues. yes Sorry, went out of my head. yeah scallops and capers oh uh, to do bronzino the fish i like to grill that uh the trick to all my food when i bake it is that i put water under the pan because oh. that steams the food while it's cooking. So it, oh. so if you put it under a broiler, uh, the outside gets become, becomes crisp, while the inside, because of the water, retains the juices and keeps it moist. Ooh. And so that's why I like to cook. I like to cook fish. I mean, I have friends who come here every week and I cook for them. And that really came out of COVID because we didn't have too many places to, to go. Yeah. And they knew it was safe here. And because we never got COVID, none of us. So, you know, it was a good environment and a healthy one. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. You had some great friends that appreciated you. Yes, they did. And they still do. <laughs> but <laughs> I like to spoil them. You know, let's face it. Kindness is a thing I think we should all show. You know, it's part of the Greek heritage, too. You know, when you come into a Greek house, the first thing they do is when you sit down is they bring you a tray. And on that tray are chocolates and brandies and sweets, you know. But it's it's a way of, you know, having people feel welcome to the house. I mean, when you go and you see somebody bring out some peanuts and a beer, you go to yourself, oh, this person's not generous at all. So, you know, you must become, your spirit is, is generous. And the only thing, the reason why it's not is because for selfish reasons, you're either cheap or you don't like the person, you know, who you have invited really, because if you love a person, you want to show them what, how you respect them as well. So food does that. Exactly. My, uh, my mother, uh, God rest her soul, uh, sister, she had two sisters left. So her one sister is uh, 91 and she's just a hoot and she doesn't cook. because She's kind of got a little bit of senior dementia, but she, when I just visited her last night, so make sure you come over next week so I can make you some tortillas. She's the Hispanic side. and She'll just go on about making food for me and she doesn't cook. And it's just, it's so wonderful, but it's sad too, because, you know, she's was such a great cook and, you know, they take care of her now. So, but I understand yeah. that about food. Yeah, it happens to all of us. Hopefully, the investment you made along the way, the people will appreciate, especially if they're younger, and treat you in the same way that you took care of them. Yeah. Some people don't. Some people are just on the take. A lot of people, I found. That's true. Uh, they don't know how to call and say thank you. They don't know. They, they just leave, and it's like it never happened. And they have no idea what it takes to go shopping and bringing the food in the house and and making the 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 recipe and then serving it and all the rest that goes along with having a dinner party and when people don't do that we used to write notes in the old days and thanking and all that some people yes, still do that. i still do i love to yeah, yeah. But we've, we've gone from the phone call to the text now. text yes and i'm like no i i still send christmas cards and birthday cards and I don't, I don't i don't appreciate text because uh, and they're just words, but they don't resonate because I don't hear them. I don't hear your voice telling them to me. I just found, yes. you know, what does it take to make yeah. a phone call and saying thank you? you know, people I'll send a text to say, is it okay to call? Because you never know what people, especially depending on their career or what they do, is it okay to call? And then, you know, I'll call them because sometimes, you know, they, they might be in a meeting and get all frustrated, like, oh. <laughs> so, yes. But that's what I use my texting for, so. 
So, Ateo, do you live here in California or New York? Yes. No, I live in Los Angeles. I live in the hills. Um, okay. I've been in the hills 20 years um, in one area of the hills and then now 21 years here. Um, nice. Th this is, you know, can you see? Oh, my goodness. What is that? That's the yard. Oh, my gosh. Beautiful. And I have this fantastic yard. And I've got lots of fruit trees. And... <gasps> oh, I'll have to come and visit. <laughs> <laughs> it's nice at night because it all gets lit. It all gets lit up at night, so it gives a, an atmosphere oh, that's kind beautiful. of wonderful. But lately, I've been getting the uh, coyotes, and they've been eating all my fruit. Really? Oh, I didn't know they and, did that. <laughs> oh my God! They climb trees. Those animals are unbelievable. I even put nets around the peaches and, and the plum trees, and they still get underneath and climb. And, I and didn't know that. You've got your squirrels, and then you've got your raccoons. It's like a zoo. And because I don't have any animals. Oh, to keep them away. To keep them away or bark. To, <laughs> then there's, but next door, you know, they went and ripped the throats of my neighbor's dog a couple of weeks ago. Oh. And the dog survived, but my goodness, they're, they look very yeah. healthy, but they jump fences. You know, I put a fence up thinking yeah. that would stop them. No, they actually find a way of going along an edge because they're really, I mean, just the way they were, the sneaky. Agile, yeah. Yeah, very agile. <laughs> Jeez. Oh, my goodness. Well, let's talk about this. I hear about this upcoming podcast, The Lost yeah. Treasures. Let's talk about that. What kind of research did you do to uh, start that? 20 years. Got it. <laughs> right. It's not an, it's not an overnight success story. I but while the process was phenomenal, um I went through 60,000 documents of Schliemann who discovered Troy and Mycenae. Um I did that within 2 weeks of going to the Gennadius Library in Athens from 9 to 5. I was there all day, but I felt like a scholar because I was reading his diaries and and uh, all the clippings. Um, I actually, say, I just want to read you something. Okay. That's when I started to find out about this man, who in 1830, at the age of eight, said to his father, one day when his father gave him the, uh, a book on in the Iliad, one day I'm going to find the Tro Trojan treasure because it's full of gold. And the father said, no, 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 that's just a myth. <clears throat> And so in 1873, he did. But that journey, that arc of life that he led, he became a billionaire because he became a merchant prince in Russia, married a Greek woman by the name of Sophia Menos, and uh, he wanted to have his Helen of Troy by his side when he would find this treasure. So he married a 16-year-old girl, and he was 47. And with together... She helped him because she was quite the scholar. She helped him discover what he did. And so when he discovered the Trojan treasure, which is the first one, the first one is about going, following the, the Iliad as a map of finding Troy. That's what he did. What he found and what he smuggled out of Turkey because the Turks were going to keep it. They had this thing where they, they wrote a contract with him, but he had overheard that they were going to steal it all from him. He wasn't going to get anything because they said it was our culture. Well, it wasn't their culture. It was a, a different culture. It wasn't, you know, the the um, Middle East, you know, the invasions of those countries was in the 7th century AD. So when you think of what this was during an illiterate age, uh, Homer was in the eighth, uh, ninth century. So when he finally took the treasure out and gave it to Athens for a short time before it was given to Turkey, I mean to uh, Germany, they said, when he tried, he said, I want to now explore the other side of the Trojan story, which was Agamemnon and Menelaus and the whole theory on, on Helen of Troy. So he went there to these this incredible citadel with monolithic stones. And within that citadel in in the 1870s, they wouldn't give him a ferment to, to give him permission because they thought he'd steal it like he did with Turkey. He said that he would leave the treasure with Greece, which he did. But when, when he started to say what he had found, 
This is what the Times of London said. Schliemann continues to deny the world of intellectuals who have devoted their entire lives to the world of the past, but let him proceed and prove himself to be but the butt of our amusement. The graves, he states, will never be found within the citadel of walls of Mycenae unless the destroyer of Troy seeds graves during the night, as we believe he did with the Trojan collection. So they never wanted to believe him. Doesn't matter what he, because he was the father of archaeology. And anyway, he found it. And what he found, I mean, can you imagine you're digging into this citadel and you're carefully because you don't want to break anything. So very carefully for six weeks. And when at one point he came to this humongous shield, when he took the shield out underneath the shield, he found this golden mask. When he raised the mask, you imagine from 1400, 13, 1400 BC, he actually found a human face that didn't have a nose, had all its teeth and its eyes. And within seconds, it just turned to dust once it was exposed to the air. So he was able to, so he did five of them. So those treasures now belong, now are in the, in the um, archaeological museum in Athens. And so that's what the, the second one is. But there was a curse and it was called the curse of Atreus. And the amount of, um, which I loved as part of the second podcast, that curse was so unbelievable and how it was passed down that I truly believed that Schliemann ended up dying basically in the gutter in Naples. And when he, his children didn't have, he didn't have any, uh, they, there were no heirs. Once he died and the, the children died, it all died, the whole heritage of Schliemann died as well. And that's why in the Genadius Library of all these documents. And then the third one is the finding of Ulysses, the real island of where Ulysses, because that's the Odyssey of Homer. And I met last year uh, in, in Greece, I went and met this fantastic English scholar and explorer by the name of John Crawshaw. And for a whole day, we went up and down the mountains in this, in this island of called Kefalonia. And he showed me what they had found. And um, and then the fourth one is basically about some of the stories that I, I had ex explored um, when I saw the pyramids for the first time uh, at one o'clock in the morning. And I was sobbing, to be honest with you. I just couldn't believe that that dream of mine, that those pyramids were just at my feet as I looked up on a full moon. And then I, they tried to, tried to kidnap me, five men. Anyway, I escaped them. So the stories uh, are different stories that ha haven't been told yet, but that's the fourth. Yeah, and then that's coming out uh, Tuesday, September 5th, I understand. Yes, the first one. And then the second, two weeks later, and it'll come every two weeks. Okay, so then it says your fourth one will uh, conclude on uh, Tuesday, October 17th. So yes. uh, our uh, viewers, listeners can find that on all major podcast platforms, yes. like Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, yes. Amazon Music, iHeartRadio, so on and so on. So we want to yes. make sure we will definitely um, put a link out there for our um, readers uh, oh, to be you. able to, uh, you know, get that and, and everything else uh, about you. Uh, I can't wait. It's going to be so exciting to be part of the podcast. Well, the thing was, you know, I'm used to uh, it's other people's dialogue. I've been used to it through all my years as an actor um, and other people's uh, producing this really to be in a in a room where you don't have to worry about a camera and you no makeup or anything of that stuff that you get tired of and just tell your story, oh. you know. The difference between telling a story and being a storyteller because in the ancient world when people couldn't read during the illiterate age uh, around the 8th century uh, bc to the 13th century bc they had they used to go to 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 bars that they had where men used to sit and drink and and smoke their cigarettes and have the greek coffee and there would be a, a an ancient a, a bard as they called them yeah. and he would recite with a with an instrument and tell the stories of of the gods that walked their earth, you know. Wow. And so it became, that's how they told stories. Like we watch and go to movies and see those dreadful big action movies that don't re sustain. Yeah. And and there's no there's no story. These were storytellers. 
Yeah. And sometimes I think, you know, we don't know enough of that. And so we have to remind people when they go to other cultures is to study up on that culture and its history so you're not ignorant when you land there. So you understand how other people live as opposed to the way you live. And so, so it's been a real great trip and the special sound effects that they put in, I was very pleased to have them. You know, it takes time, takes a lot of work, but yeah. I, the hard thing about it was, it was a great and enjoyable, it's like the radio, when we used to just listen to the radio yes. uh -huh. and our imagination soared. Exactly, I actually listen to classic radio all day long. I love yeah. the old classic radio, you know, so. Yeah. But this is amazing because it sounds like maybe you'll continue. This is going to be a hit, I guarantee. So we'll have more of your travels. Well, I hope so. I, you know, I, I always wanted to tell the stories, the great love stories of through the centuries. That's yeah. what I'd like to talk well, about. Well, that comes next then. <laughs> that that comes next. Or there are stories from my book, Places, that I'd love to talk about. You know, even when I met Jacqueline Kennedy Oh. Or, you know, when I worked with Telly Savalas and Omar Sharif, all these stories. Yeah. Uh, some wonderful tales there and um, how people who crossed my path made a difference. Please do. Um, we would appreciate hearing all that. That's so fascinating. And, and look, and I salute you. I'm having my Greek coffee, which I do, and I've been doing all my life. <laughs> <laughs> I bet you that's some good stuff. <laughs> well, they found out when they tested it, it's one of the best things you can drink because it clears the arteries. Oh, I need some of that. <laughs> yeah. So you can get it online. You can get a okay. coffee called Venizelos, and that's spelled V-E-N-I-Z-E-L-O-U-S, Venizelos. And you can get it uh, on on um, Amazon. And oh, I'm going to order some. You'll love it. And, and you know, the way you make it is you just take a – you measure the cup, and for each cup you put a heap teaspoon of the Greek coffee – you put in some honey, and then you put in cardamom. You just shake in some cardamom, and it gives you a, a kind of Middle Eastern kind of taste, but it's wonderful for you. Oh, it sounds amazing. I'm going to order me some today yeah. and try it. Yeah. Well, we appreciate you taking the time. That's it's well, Like you. I said, I can't wait till the podcast comes out. It's going to be a, a huge hit and, and look forward to uh, anything else. What else are you working on currently? Well, I just finished the script on the story of Schliemann. Okay. I've written a film script with, the, with uh, Sherry Anderson okay. and Chris Phillips. The three of us have uh, written this script, and it's um, it's really about his great love story and how he found the great treasure of Troy. And that's uh, it's an action film because it's not about just you know going in and digging. That becomes what he finds towards the end. But to get there is quite the adventure. Even when he goes oh. through and finds cannibals in 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 um, the isthmus yeah. um, in South America in the Amazon when his boat uh, crashes. So you know some really good stuff about his story and. I think his story should be told. I mean, we must remember those who made a difference in yes. our in our uh, curriculum of history because people forget. People don't even know what happened five years ago. Exactly. And, you know what I mean? Exactly. And, so and thank you for to... bringing that to us. Oh, no, thank you. We appreciate so it. I've done that one. And I mean, uh, we're waiting now to see what's going to happen with Days of Our Lives. Um not because of the strike, but because there's some drama going on. And so, therefore, you know, I've been on that show for 41 years. Oof. And, you know, it, it played an important part because it, uh, Days paid for those journeys. And, yeah. Thank uh, you, and Days. <laughs> thank you, Days. Thank you, Ken Corday. Yes. yes. Yeah. Oh, more thank to come. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. I hope you yeah. enjoy it. Oh, I, I can't wait. And the Hollywood Times dot today. appreciate you giving us the time and telling us about that because we were sure put that out for all of our viewers and readers. Thank you. God bless. God bless you too. Okay.